The idea is to sequence the DNA from a patient with cancer, sequence the tumor DNA as well as the non-tumor DNA to identify all the mutations that are just found in the tumor DNA and not in the patient's matching normal DNA, and then to filter out the silent mutations and see what's left. So what's the scope of this big project? Well, as of about um, eight months ago, we had the results from sequencing 4,000 human cancers from 23 different types of cancer, and some of those are listed here. Um, this is an example of a project that was felt to be so important that everyone needed to work together and so big that it could not be accomplished without everyone working together. Um, and it was really gratifying uh, to see how well people interacted. And we actually set up some rules for cooperation as this project started, such that when the sequence data would come off the machine and go through its first pass of computer-based analysis to get the you know, first look at what the sequence was telling us, it was immediately posted um, on internet accessible uh, data uh, uh, sets that could be accessed by all the investigators in this project, as well as other scientists interested in, in looking at the data in real time. So a fantastic example of how scientists can work well together. So I want, you to, I want to pause for a minute and just get you to think about what are the possible questions that can be asked and answered once you have this avalanche of data. Um, and one of the first ones uh, that comes to mind is, in each individual patient's tumor, how many mutations actually are there? Well, as of a, a, a data analysis from earlier this year, the number of cancer genes is 140. Some cancer genes are oncogenes uh, that, when mutated, now function as accelerators, driving cell growth inappropriately, whereas others, the tumor suppressor genes, normally function as breaks, but when broken or disabled, the cell cycle can proceed more quickly. So you can think of this genetically now. On the left-hand side, you've got two copies of a proto-oncogene. Uh, if one gets mutated, it's dominant. A, do a mutated protein drives the cell cycle as a go signal, whereas on the right-hand side, you have a tumor suppressor gene. One copy gets lost, there's no protein made, but the cell cycle is still okay until you, you lose the second copy, and you have a mutant form of the protein or a missing form, and the cell cycle proceeds inappropriately. Um, and the balance or ratio amongst those 140 between the dominant oncogenes and what we think are the you know, recessive suppressor genes is 60 to 80. Now, I don't want you to leave and go home and say, guess what, we know there are only 140 cancer genes, or because I guarantee you a paper will be published sometime in the next few months, an update of this, in which it won't be 140. But I promise you it won't be 1,040, it will be 150 or maybe just south of 200. So we know the size of the problem now, we know it's not exponential, um, we, can, we can really start to envision complete understanding of all the, ca the genetic causes of cancer. So with 140 cancer genes, can we now categorize them into different buckets um, and, and, and see some patterns that are emerging? And the answer is yes. So in this circle, I'm showing you three different categories um, that this community of cancer scientists has agreed upon uh, to lump these into. Um, and again, don't, don't hold me to this as only three. Um, I suspect, and I actually even know, that there'll be little tiny you know, additions to this, perhaps new categories that emerge, but they're not going to be big dominant causes of major uh, percentages of cancer. So let's look at the 71 cell growth and survival uh, genes. What are these? This is over half of the cancer genes. These are ones that you're familiar with, and many of which we talked about yesterday. These are the proto-oncogenes. These are genes that are involved in signaling pathways in, in cells that sense signals from outside the cell and regulate the normal growth uh, of various tissues. A classic example being the epidermal growth factor receptor, which we'll talk about in some detail uh, in the second half of the talk. Another group of proteins uh, or genes that is part of this growth, cell growth and survival set, those 71, 
are the genes that regulate the cell cycle. So yesterday, uh, we talked about the two genes on the right-hand side, P53 and the retinoblastoma gene. These are tumor suppressor genes, um, which uh, function as breaks on the cell cycle, and you have to have loss of two copies uh, of each in order to get cancer. Um, but on the left-hand side are some examples of additional genes that have come out from this analysis as well as from other uh, cancer biology studies that are positive regulators of the cell cycle, that receive signals from the growth factors from outside the cell and cause cells to enter mitosis. And in those class of genes, uh, just like we talked about yesterday, you only need one mutation in the gene. Those are dominant. Okay. So what about this category at the bottom, genome maintenance? There are nine genes that we've put into that category. What does that mean? As you probably know, when the DNA is replicated in a normal cell, DNA polymerase is a really good enzyme, but it's not perfect, and there's mistakes that are made. About every billion bases, there's a mistake made. And in order to correct the mistakes, uh, we have proofreading enzymes which go back and read the, the new sequence and fix the errors. So here's an example of a mistake that was made. Um, there's a G here, which, as you obviously know, should have had a C, but there was a T put there by mistake. So a proofreading enzyme cruises across the DNA, stops, recognizes that mistake, and fixes it, and moves on and looks, scans the rest of the DNA for other errors. So this proofreading system is pretty darn good, um, but as I said, one in a billion bases can be mutated and gets missed. Well, imagine what would happen if you had a mutation in the proofreading enzyme itself. Suddenly, you would accumulate mutations at an extremely rapid rate, and that's exactly what happens in these patients with 1,000 or more mutations per tumor. Um, and the types of tumors that have that problem is a form of colon cancer. Uh, it's not all colon cancers, but that's when this was, where this was first discovered. So repair genes are, um, are important in limiting mutations and loss of function, uh, recessive mutations in those repair genes leads to this phenotype. Now the third category, which is a big category, 60 genes as of this update, I've called cell fate. So what do I mean by cell fate? Well, I'm talking about the, the process by which um, a stem cell from a tissue differentiates, uh, gives birth to progeny, progenitor cells, which then further differentiate into mature cells of whatever tissue that is. Um, and eventually, those mature, fully differentiated cells tend to die. But how, do the, how does a mutation in such a, uh, a gene that regulates that process cause cancer? Well, it doesn't change the proliferation rate of the cell. It just blocks the ability of the cell to undergo one of those steps in differentiation. So if there's a block, uh, there's a pileup of cells that are trying to get through that block, and that pileup of cells can form a tumor. Uh, 